broadcasting live from the Capitol OTB studios. This is Racing Across America with Seth Merrow. Good morning and welcome to Racing Across America on this Saturday morning. Another nice Saturday of stakes action ahead. And in fact, we'll talk about plenty of that a little bit later on. We'll be joined by Matt Dinnerman from Oaklawn Park. They have the Apple Blossom and the Count Fleet uh, today. We'll get some thoughts there and maybe some thoughts on Matt Summer now uh, heading out to Monmouth Park. Uh, congratulations to him. Certainly, we'll talk a little bit about that also. But it's a big day at Keeneland as well. Maybe some derby implications. We shall see in the Lexington, but a couple other nice stakes on the card as well. And with three-year-old action heating up now that things are pretty much in the books as far as Kentucky Derby and who may be headed that way, other than what might happen in the Lexington, who better to reach out to to talk a little Keeneland because he handicaps the Keeneland meet for their website every day. And with the countdown to the crown package, our friend Jeremy Plunk. Jeremy, good morning. Good morning. I'm happy I'm going before Matt Dinnerman, not after him. He's like the hottest guy in racing right now. So uh, he would be a tough act to follow. Congrats to him. He's really on a high trajectory. No, it, it, it's absolutely. I was, I was happy for him. I mean, that, that's that, as for an announcer, that's a great because now he's got the year-round rotation and, and deservedly so. I mean, I think he was getting a lot of positive feedback from his, uh, his Oakland season so far. Yeah, and it's a good life lesson, right? I mean, it looked like things were bleak for a guy who was the Golden Gate Gold, Field track yeah. announcer, and, and and it looked, you know, they're closing their doors here in, in a couple of weeks, and and look what happened. Yeah. You know, good things happen to good people. So, uh, hats off to him. That's a great point. Great point. Uh, before we get into uh, some Keeneland and, and uh, three-year-old action as well, I always like to give you a little chance to uh, also tout your your uh, podcast with uh, Jeff Siegel. I, as I told you before, I sit in the office at night and I pull up a lot of YouTube videos in the background while I'm handicapping for the next day or really two or three days uh, ahead as far as the afternoon show here. But talk a little bit about the uh, the podcast and where and when people can find it. Yeah, we have a Tuesday podcast called It's Official where we kind of recap the week and we get into a little debate, a little pardon the interruption kind of style, I guess you would say, uh, to to steal from a successful platform uh, that uh, debuts on Tuesday afternoons. And uh, you can see that on Twitter at Horse Player Now or on the Horse Player Now YouTube channel. So uh, check those out there. And then on Friday, we do one called First Call where we handicap stakes races for the weekend. So we took a look at a couple of Keeneland races for Friday and then six races for Saturday across the country. So uh, each week we take a look at eight races on that and get into some handicapping nuts and bolts. And uh, you can also listen to those uh, most places where you get your podcasts, iTunes, things like that. Uh, we do audio versions of those podcasts too. So if you're, if you're wanting to be on the treadmill or something like that <laughs> or in the car and you need something to listen to, we can help you out. Very good. And as I say, I watch it in the office. But yeah, uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts in the car as well. So that's a, a nice uh, heads up you gave there also. Um, countdown to the crown package. We are moving into the crown and we'll talk three-year-olds a little bit before we wrap up with you this morning. But I always uh, highly tout the, the countdown to the crown package, which comes out every Friday. Reviews and previews, three-year-old stakes action. And uh, it's always very fun and informative. And I heard you on the, the radio with Bick this week, and you were talking about, and, and I have to admit, as you said it, I thought, okay, that makes a lot of sense. You, know, you don't think about it when you read it. But as you said it, then I really began to appreciate the amount of work that goes in. And you, I think you said, you know, I debated stopping at one point, but people like it so much you kept going. And I, I will, as a, a an avid reader of it, I will uh, express my appreciation for the work you put into Countdown to the Crown. Well, I, I, I thank you for that. Uh, you know, and I also said in the, in the deal is I couldn't give it up. It's like a habit you can't <laughs> give up. I really enjoy writing it, you know. I mean, I, I made my first dabble into the racing industry in 1993. It's been 31 years. I've written Countdown to the Crown for 19. It's about 5,000 words a week, 23 weeks a year. I think we're up over the 2 million word mark, something like that, oh, over man. the course of writing the thing. But I absolutely love it. I mean, it's, it's like some weeks I can't get past Sunday before I get sit down and start writing the reviews from Saturday's races. I don't even like wait till Monday to get into it because I'm like excited to kind of you know, dig into what I just saw on Saturday. So 
it is a lot of work. It, it takes me, you know, upwards of about 20 hours a week to finish it. Uh, and that's half a week's work for some people. But for me, it's just kind of the, the warm up, it's the calisthenics to the rest of the stuff. <laughs> uh, but I, I just love doing it, you know, and it's so, uh, I haven't been able to put it down after 19 years. Uh, we've got a couple more editions yet, uh, to come up this uh, week's edition, of course. Previews the Lexington Stakes on Saturday. Now next week, all of a sudden, they changed the schedule around on us, and what used to be kind of a, a dry period next week, we've got three previous preps next week. You know, you've got uh, oh, uh, you got the new uh, yeah, the new Illinois yeah. Derby pushed in that spot, and uh, I think there's two other ones that are coming up uh, uh, next to the Federico Tessio and 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 maybe even a third race. So there's a lot going on, and then I'm going to have the one I, I love, which will be next week as well which is the historical comparables, which is it, it, the fun, this is the most entertaining thing I write, period, after all these years, uh, where I take a look at this year's crop and compare them to horses in the past and, and see if history can't be predictive of, like, look, horses had this identical resume, this kind of pedigree, and, and they got to the Triple Crown Series, and here's what they did. Now, this horse looks to be out of the exact same cut and mold. How will they fare? And I, and for like anybody who follows sports, that's kind of like, you know, is it LeBron or Jordan, yeah. right? I mean, is it Wilt or, or, or is it uh, MB now? You know, I mean, like you're always trying to compare people over eras and things like that. And, uh, I, I just love doing that thing. And as a historian, you know, I spent 17 years doing the research for ESPN and, and for, uh, NBC on the Triple Crown telecast and putting those packets together. That's one thing I could put down after 17 years, Seth. I mean, that was a lot of work and, and a lot of stress and, and uh, you know, uh, and so many different crews changing over doing the TV, right? The people that you're working with, the Tom Hammonds retire and new people come in and things like that. Uh, that was more for them, you know. Uh, Town on the Crown is more for me. I love doing it for myself and for the readers out there who also enjoy it. So, um as long as I'm doing racing, I'll be doing that. Yeah, and again, I, I highly tout it. The folks haven't checked it out yet, and I'm sure people who watch the show have jumped on board. But every Friday comes out, a lot of good information, a lot of fun information. I love and, and you put the historical facts in uh, week in and week out, too, on some of these stakes races. And I, I love the historical facts because I think – you know, day to day in horse racing, they're not going to play out, obviously, in claimers on a Thursday. But the Kentucky yeah. Derby is the same spot on the calendar every year. You have to get mm -hmm. to it the same way. Now, horse racing and the way trainers train has changed. And so maybe some of the trends yeah. don't hold up. But, you know, you go back five or 10 years, certainly you can start to look and, and get a feel for some of those that, that will play out. And so I love that. And again, appreciate uh, the work you put in. And just before we get to, uh, uh, the the actual handicapping. Also, want to let you tout, uh, and I've said your selections are on the Keeneland website every racing day. But you also put put out a little video. What the night before Keeneland look ahead? People can find that on Twitter yeah. and, and YouTube as well. Yeah, you can go to the Keeneland uh, YouTube page for that, or the Horse Player Now uh, Twitter and YouTube pages for those. Uh, the Keeneland look ahead is about a 30, 35, 40 minute podcast. Depends how verbose I am that night or how many races they have on the card where we go through the entire program, the stats and trends, what's happening, you know, what you should look for. We talk a lot about, like, uh, track conditions and weather and car times and things like that this week to see if the track was slowing or, you know, or if it was going to kind of speed back up with, with the slop. And, uh, you know, it, it's pretty in-depth. It's for serious handicappers, I think, but uh, I like that. They've asked me to do a couple one, two-minute videos this year for the folks who don't like the in-depth and, and those also stream out the morning of the races. So I've got a daily double play each day for Keenan and a short form video, and then kind of a just general two minute overview of the card. But if you like to sit down and you really like to get after a race and, and talk about it, then, then the Look Ahead podcast the night before, 8.30 Eastern is when it debuts uh, each night before the next day's racing. So if there's a Wednesday card coming up, it'll be Tuesday night for Wednesday. Uh, tonight we will look at the Sunday card, for instance. But if you don't catch it live, catch it in the archives and, uh, you know, we're doing really well with that. We, we've gotten some big numbers, and, and I kind of like uh, – I'm proud of this one. But earlier this week, TVG ran an extreme up against ours at the exact same time, and, and we drew more viewers than TVG, which I thought was really good because nice. I think – if we compare the two budgets, I think we did pretty good. <laughs> nice. Yeah, very good. Uh, and I'm glad you brought up the double because I, I, I didn't even think, but that's worth bringing up. Uh, Keeneland changing up, uh, you know, take out what on a double. And I'm always curious as to how fans take to the whole takeout question. 
But it seems like as far as that double, it's been working out because the numbers uh, early on seem like people are jumping in playing that Keeneland double. Yeah, you know, it's reduced to 15%. Yeah. It was 22. So, you know, that's seven points back in your pocket when you win. And I, I think that's really important. And also, too, the daily double is under leveraged by horse players because yeah. we get so many short field races or heavy favorites, and you just think this is a pass, or or you get creative, or you get too cute and try to beat a short price horse. Just take that horse with the one you like in the next race, and instead of yeah. getting six to one on the horse you like the next race, by pairing that three to five shot with it, you're turning that six to one into like a 10, 12, 14 to one shot. Uh, in the daily double. So it's really an advantageous play to use it to your benefit. And it really, in this day and age, with short fields, heavy favorites, and, and where you feel like the edge is gone in the wind pool in some cases, it can really be a boost to your to your playing that you're going to get value in the double that you won't get in the wind pool. Totally agree. And I think in, in this age of pick threes, pick fours, pick five, uh, pick sixes, uh, people overlook the double, and I think it's a fun bet if yeah. folks step back and look at it a little more. All right, let's jump in, and we'll kind of work our way backwards here. Keeneland this afternoon, uh, about quarter to six, the Lexington grade three event. Some potential derby implications in here with Haiti, certainly. Um, I pulled up a replay of the uh, John Battaglia. We're going to look at number 12 and Sino getting it done. I put that one on top, and I see on Countdown mm -hmm. to the Crown – uh, you have that one right there in your mix, and you're looking at liberal arts. I put liberal arts at the bottom of my mix. I thought Wine Steward was very interesting on the comeback, and then I also had Hades in my mix. But Encino, to me, from the Brad Cox barn, trying the dirt for the first time off of these three races at Turfway, very intriguing being lately raced. So I'm going to play around with him. What did you see in the mm -hmm. Lexington? Yeah, I'm with you. Look, this is a race that historically closers have done really well in. And you get to the end of the Derby Trail here, and it's a mile and a 16th. So you're getting a mix of horses who couldn't cut it distance-wise and then other horses who are trying to get into the Derby. So this pace is usually quick, and this race falls apart. I mean, the average winner of the Lexington is about six lengths off the lead after the opening half mile, which is like a crazy stat, you know, when you look at when you look at a mile and a 16th race at Keelan. So... Uh, I think the late runners have a shot in here again. You've got, you know, the one steward coming off a layoff. I think he's vulnerable in that spot. We never know how good a two-year-old is going to come back at three. I haven't had the ability to see his workout. So I think he's kind of betting him blind off his two-year-old form, which I really don't want to do when I have horses that I know in a race, you know. It's one thing to bet a horse off a layoff in like a standard maiden or allowance race where the horses are just kind of to use stats on paper, you know. But when you've seen these horses as many times as we have uh, throughout the Triple Crown series and you know them well, I'd rather trust what I know and yeah. what I've seen than what I saw as a two-year-old, and I'm hoping. Um, so I do think this race comes back to closers. Uh, Hades is going to go to the front. He needs a derby point. So, again, that, you know, lucky Jeremy in that same spot, he's going to go. So I think it comes to the closers, and I think Encino and Liberal Arts are by far the two best horses in this race from off the pace. And I think that they're going to have the last laugh in here. Encino's win at Turfway was good. I mean, the horse who ran second that day that he ran down is really good. He came back and ran third in the Bluegrass State, um, talking about epic ride, you know. So he comes out of a good race. Brad Cox has won this race three of the last four years for Lexington. He did it a couple years ago with Tawny Fort, who, like Encino, was coming off the Turfway synthetic. Uh, and then Tony Fort made his way to the Kentucky Derby and has gone on to a pretty nice career. So I think Encino fits. I mean, he, you know, he's good off and he's got blue blood. There's, there's nothing cheap about this horse coming off a of turf way. And, and, and people mess that up with Brad Cox. I was telling a guy I worked with yesterday, uh, on a messenger service. We were like messaging back and forth. I said, Brad Cox, this horse is from Turfway and Horseshoe Indianapolis get no respect yeah. at Keeneland. And everybody thinks that they're B level horses. They are not the level horses when they show up for Brad Cox here. And like, especially in the fall, keep this one in mind. I, I looked it up real quick because I was like, I don't want to just tell somebody something and not look it up quick. Brad Cox's ROI with Horseshoe Indy horses in the fall at Keeneland, $1.61 for every dollar you bet. I mean, it's unbelievable. A 60% <laughs> profit betting his horses. So you got to wait for the fall for that one to mark it down. But, you know, Turfway horses, he won with two yesterday on the card via Turfway. So I'd have no shock in here whatsoever if Encino wins the race. He'll be heavily played in my wages for sure. I'm only going too deep. The one I do like, though, is Liberal Arts. I love this horse to win the Arkansas Derby. Uh, I bet him in the Arkansas Derby. I watched the saddling. He looked so good before the race. I bet twice the amount on him in the Arkansas Derby. 
And then during the warm up, he melted down. And I was like, oh boy, this isn't good. <laughs> and then at the start of the race, he got knocked around a little bit. And then the first turn, he just lost his mind, ran over half the field, and ended up getting disqualified. But after he ran over half the field, he dropped back to last, made a second move in the race, and then was completely out of gas. If he keeps his head about him, I'm telling you, Seth, this is a good closer who can make some noise in the Triple Crown Series. I, I think that this liberal arts is legitimately a horse who's going to hit a super factor somewhere in the Triple Crown Series. He may not get to the Kentucky Derby because he'd have to win today and then have some luck of some other horses or misfortune of other horses dropping out of the Derby. But uh, he's not going to get there on points the way it looks, even with a win, unless something else happens to others. But that can certainly happen if we have a few weeks until Derby Day. Liberal Arts and Tino are both horses, I think, if they run well today, you're going to want to put them on your tickets in future races here in the Triple Crown. Yeah, I, I have Liberal Arts at the bottom of my mix. And I, he, I'm intrigued. That, you know, I ride or tease Alex to ride. Um, I have uh, interest in him, in him as well. But Encino, and you make a great point about those horseshoe Indy and, and Turfway runners from Brad Cox. Same thing in the summertime up at Saratoga. You get the Monmouth runners from Chad Brown and Todd Fletcher. Oh, they have a B-string yeah. if they're coming up. Yeah, uh, ignore them at yeah. your own risk uh, is the, the situation. It's the same with those Cox runners uh, in the Midwest. All right, let's yeah. let's take a look at the uh, ninth, the Jenny Wiley. Uh, hopefully, and I've been checking while you were talking. I don't see any update uh, as far as surface. Hopefully, they, they stay on yesterday. Oh, how about Master of the Seas yesterday for Charlie Appleby? Woo. Yeah. Man, he's fun to watch, yeah. right? I mean, yeah, he looked like a winner every step of the way, yeah. and he looked just fabulous. That was that was a great comeback race. His stable mate, of course, second was what six or seven lifetime going into that race. Uh, you know, so he beat a good one. They're both going to stay in the U.S. We're going to see him uh, on Derby Day. The way Apple oh, nice. said, they're going to run in the Turf Classic at Churchill. So the race before the Kentucky Derby just got a little bit juicier. Uh, all right, let's take a look. As I say, uh, turf for uh, the Jenny Wiley this afternoon, a uh, grade one event, mile and a 16th. Um, I pulled up a replay going back to, hey, I'm a homer. I pulled up the Saratoga Oaks Invitational. We'll see number three, Elusive Princess, uh, get it done in here. Um, and reading, you know, pulling up the Keeneland website and looking at your picks, uh, I know you were looking at Elusive Princess. I went with surge capacity over Gina Romantica. I think Gina Romantica with the triple digit buyers is probably the one to beat and will take a lot of action. I thought surge capacity may have some upside here in the first start of the four year old season. Didia makes the horse in race interesting. English Rose for Charlie Appleby. But give us your thoughts in the Jenny Wiley. It's going to be a softest turf course. We know that. I yeah. mean, it rained for four straight days in Lexington. It's beautiful today, it's sunny. It's going to be a drying out main track. The turf is still going to have a lot of give to it. So in that respect, you know, I always like to give the international experienced horses and foreign bred horses the edge because our American horses just don't get to train at all on soft turf. Yeah. They rarely get to run on soft turf. So it's just inbred in the international horses to have an advantage in these kind of races. Um, so when you look at that, like, like Fluffy Sox is a real top of ground runner for Chad Brown. Like if you look at Chad's horses in there, you know, Gina Romantica, I'm not sure how she's going to run on soft turf. I think surge capacity is the Chad horse who's probably got the best chance with some given the ground, right? Won the Lake George in a bog last year at Saratoga, uh, has that, uh, foreign pedigree by Flincher. I like that one in those terms, uh, Bo uh, Cache, the other Chad Brown horse has the international experience. I just don't think she's quite as good as some of the others, but you get Frankie Dettori and Chad Brown in a grade one, you could do a lot worse than that on the turf. Uh, but I do think it comes down to, you know, Elusive Princess and English Rose. These are the two horses that really have a lot of foreign experience, a lot of, I think, soft ground ability. Look at the soft ground and yielding type turfs that Elusive Princess has raced on over in France. She has a fantastic record in those races. Uh, I thought the last race, the Hillsboro down at uh, Tampa Bay Downs, was run so falsely. I mean, 52 to the half, yeah. 117. She had no chance, and she still got beat a length in there. I thought that's the perfect prep race. It's now second off the layoff. And the race she ran here in the Queen Elizabeth II Challenge Cup in the fall was really good because Maj and Lindy were awesome that day. Maj came back and came within a whisker of beating the boys in the Breeders' Cup mile off of that race. She ran really well. She did all the dirty work chasing the pace in that race. I thought that means that she likes the turf course here at Keeneland, and the fact that it's soft now goes back to her French form. I think Elusive Princess has a real good shot in here, and beating four Chad Browns is not going to be easy. 
and a Charlie Appleby. So you better demand a little bit of a price to do so. Junior Alvarado rides. Uh, you know, he had a couple wins earlier this week at Keeneland, so he's riding good at the meets. And uh, I'm going to take my chances with the Lusa Princess, but I'm trying to beat Appleby and four Browns. <laughs> so I'm, I'm swimming upstream. I know that. I, I I used the Appleby at the bottom of my mix, and, and I and as I say, I have Didia in with a couple of the Chad Browns, and I really looked at Elusive Princess on pretty much what you're saying. You know, you go back to the first start in the United States, it was over a soft course at Saratoga, and you're right. After We know after yesterday that the course is going to have all, plenty of give to it. So I looked, and, and now you may be talking me into somehow using that one a little. But if if we get well, the right price. On firm ground, I would have Didia absolutely in my yeah, mix, too, if yeah. somebody's wondering why I have that mentioned Diddy on firm ground, I would absolutely have Diddy in it. I think she's kind of like one of those top of ground. She loved it when she went west to California, and you know, that's a pool yeah. table turf course out there in California, so it's going to be completely different. She may be good enough. I mean, don't get me wrong, we don't see anything in her form that says I've run on soft turf and I can't, but I'm just going to like not make the assumption that she can, and what's going to be one of the you know top three or four choices in the race, Diddy is going to get played so. Uh, this is a tough race. There's so many good options to take in here. Hopefully we land on the right one. Yeah, fun race. All right, uh, and we kicked a stakes action off in the seventh, Giants Causeway. Again, scheduled on the turf at uh, five and a half furlongs. And as I say, I pulled up your, your picks on the website and saw you went with Love Rain. So I pulled up uh, Keeneland, uh, the limestone last year. Love Reigns is going to be the number three horse and get it done. Wesley Ward, I think it was the opening day, the second day, he had the winner who he said, I knew this was going to be a good horse because worked very well with Love Reigns recently. So you have that mm -hmm. going for you as well. I did not use Love Reigns. I looked and I debated and I may kick myself, but I want to play the music for Mark Cassie off the Tampa Bay Stakes win. Bling, I thought, was intriguing. Elm Drive, Roses for Deborah. But your thoughts on the Giants' causeway? It's a good race. There's a lot of depth in here. But look, Ward wins turf sprints at Kalen yeah. at almost the same rate <laughs> that he wins two-year-old baby races. And people just like they, – they make him an automatic punch in the two-year-old baby races, you know. But they don't realize his turf sprint record is almost as good. It's phenomenal. So he dominates these races. Uh, you get Joel Rosario, who I believe has 12 or 13 turf sprint stakes wins at Keeneland. Like, just crushes everybody. I don't even think anybody else has more than, like, five. He's got, like, 12 or 13. You got the right rider. You got the right trainer. And you look, last year, Wesley Ward won this race. Uh, Twilight Gleaming coming off the layoff from the previous year. The year before, he won with Campanelle, coming off the layoff from the previous year. A couple years before that, he won in 2017 with Lady Aurelia. Coming off the layoff, first start of the year. He's doing the exact same thing with Love Rain. It's the 12 hole. It's not the easiest, but we've actually seen Wesley win stakes races. Remember, bound from nowhere, winning. I think I think he won two major stakes from the 12 hole uh, from out there for Wesley uh, at Keeneland in these turf sprints. So I, I like Love Rain's a lot in here. Uh, we'll see about, you know, some give in the ground, but the horse, you know, is, is she's the right one for Wesley in this spot. He could have picked, you know, probably three or four different fillies who would run in this particular kind of race. And uh, I think he's got the right one that he wants in there. He gets Rosario. Um, you know, Roses for Denver is really good. Um, respect her a lot. Uh, there's a lot of good ways you can go in this race. I always tell people, too, in the big fields that Keeneland and Turf Sprints, the three, four, five posts really have a good advantage. I don't particularly like the horses in the three, four, five holes in this race. But if you're playing exotics, and this is a great race to bet exotics, right? I mean, this could be box cars when you talk about, you know, try yeah. supers. I'd mix the three, four, five in there in your exotics somewhere if you can afford to, to put them on the bottom of your ticket. They just have a good statistical advantage with that post. They're not stuck down inside. They're not hung way wide. And one of them usually finds a way to work their way in there at a price. So... Great betting race, great betting race. Love Reigns, who came out of a, a win a couple of years ago in April at Keeneland and went to Royal Ascot. And there was at least one of the Wesley Water Runners when I was in here doing the afternoon show uh, last week, uh, the first few days of the meet. Uh, I think it was the, the first one he had. I said, well, Royal Ascot probably next for that one too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, yeah, the first time starter yeah. won uh, opening day. Yeah, yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, uh, yeah he just sure. has them so ready to come out of the gate. Uh, they're fifty yards down and they're five lengths ahead. Typically, it's well. That's it's, the one. You know, he wins over half of the races offered. I want to say he's got uh, forty-five of like the eighty wins in two-year-old races <laughs> at Keeneland, going back to like twenty fifteen. 
the ones he loses, you know, which is rare, is when they don't break. Yeah. Like, they break on top. It's over. Right? Yeah. I can't remember one getting collared who broke on top. I mean, they just go. And, yeah. and yeah, he's got him ready to go out of the gate. That's also why he's really good in the turf first team, right? I yeah, mean, it's about no, the break and getting out of the hop and, and getting good position. So, uh, we'll see. But uh, it's going to be a great day of racing today. Keelan, the weather looks good, you know. Uh, the best the best we've seen since Sunday. Nice. Uh, all right. Don't want to let you go without touching a little countdown to the crown and the three year olds. As again, we've now kind of settled things. Things may shake up slightly today with the Lexington. We'll find out. But you know, I, I countdown to the crown. I pulled up your top ten, and, and your it's always fun. Your uh, three things you won't read anywhere else where you, you talk about going back a few years with the, the lone two single-digit odd horses in the Derby, and they wound up running one-two. Uh, fierceness, and we're going to take a look here at the, the stretch run to the Florida Derby. We're going to see Fierceness run, and, and I'll, I'll tell Dan in the control room, he can then just fire in uh, the, the bluegrass as well and see Sierra Leone uh, win that one. And folks are looking. I get it, totally get it. And I, I'm kind of in the camp as well. Fierceness can he get a, a straw in his path? Is that going to be a problem in a 20-horse derby? I'm not convinced yet with the number of races that's that true with him. He just may, may be much better than this crop. Sierra Leone comes from the back, and is that going to be trouble in the 20-horse field? I uh, I get that argument, but I'm starting to, to wonder if these two aren't just the, the, the two best in, in an otherwise kind of undefined field where – Nobody's really stringing them together in this prep season. So give us your, your thoughts on the top two, uh, Fierceness and Sierra Leone. Well, I love that we get the two different running styles, obviously. And, you know, the one thing about Fierceness is we, we got to be careful about, like, over-believing our exaggerations sometimes. Yeah. Because the idea is if he either runs fabulous and runs off the screen or runs terrible, He's run terrible one time. He got beat the other time, but it's not like fierceness is win or go home. You know, he ran third in the yeah. Holy Bull and didn't get beat all that far. So he is capable of just, like, not being tight enough for that race, potentially, not being sharp enough. But it's not like, oh, okay, it was a disaster, and he ran, you know, 10 feet and 40 lengths or whatever. You know, what was the champagne? Was it the, the race where he ran so yeah. poorly? Uh, you know, that was a poor effort, right? And if he had done that in his other loss, then you say, boy, there is something to it. You know, if this horse gets anything to go against him, he's going to get beat. Well, I, you know, it's the Kentucky Derby. Something's going to go against you. I mean, it's just the way that it works. Unless you get that, you know, that rubber stamp trip, a California Chrome first over kind of run, uh, you know, then you're going to, you're going to encounter things. But, I, I think we've exaggerated how badly he was in the Holy Bull. I've kind of gone back to it. I'm like, all right, you know, this this wasn't horrible. This was a horse who got beat, and a lot of horses get beat, you know. I think we're a little bit past that time where it was just – where it was a run there in the Kentucky Derby where it was just – if you had a loss on your resume, you just were a toss out in the race. It was just – we just had that run of five, six, seven years where every horse was undefeated as a three-year-old, right? They were all two for yeah. two, three for three, and – and had run off these big winning streaks. We had, what, six straight winning favorites, and now we've had six straight losing favorites, I think, uh, the way the, the, the history of the Derby has gone in recent years. So big closers have won the last two from far off the pace. I mean, Mage came from almost as far back as Rich Strike. We kind of don't think that of Mage, but look at the running lines. They both came from about the same number of flanker off the pace uh, to win the Kentucky Derby. So it's been two meltdowns in a row. So that's good. If you like Sierra Leone, you say, oh, a closer can't win the Derby. Well, then you haven't watched the last two. And if you don't think a horse who's the two-year-old champ and, and can string it together and, and, and be dominant like fierceness, then you haven't seen either with, you know, really good horses winning the Derby like Nyquist. You know, he's got basically a similar resume uh, to what Nyquist had. It, it's going to be those two in the betting. I, I think if Forever Young would have been more convincing in the UAE Derby, then we'd have a little bit different win pool, you know. But I just don't see anybody separating as the third choice in the betting now. There's that big clump of catching freedom, forever young, just a touch. You know, those horses, uh, maybe even resilience. I think resilience would be a little higher than that group. But there's no clear-cut third horse in there. So I think we're going to see a gap. There could only be two horses in single digits. And like I wrote, we haven't seen that since 2016 when it was Nyquist and Exaggerator, 2-1 to one and 5-1. to one. And, they, and they were the two best horses in the crop. And they were, ran 1-2. And then they won the Derby and the Breeches. You know, they not only ran one, two in the Derby, but 
they accounted for the preakness as well as exaggerated and turned the tables. I could see that happening again. I could see Fiercest winning the Kentucky Derby and then Sierra Leone winning the preakness. I could absolutely see that as potential um, because Todd's horses don't come back and run well in the preakness, yeah. right? So if Fiercest wins the Derby, it'd be a matter of whether or not they would come back with Sierra Leone. I do think Chad has a horse waiting for the preakness in Tuscan Gold, who is really good. And right now, if he told me who are you going to bet to win the Preakness, it'd be, you know, Mook or Tuscan Gold, you know, the two horses that are sitting out the Derby that look best to me going to Baltimore. So, uh, it, it, this is a, an interesting year without a couple horses in the Derby that, you know, would be of some significance. But I don't know that I would take Moose to win the Kentucky Derby. I don't think he's a mile and a quarter horse. Could he get away in the Preakness as the fresh horse and at a mile and three sixteenths and if the track is kind of souped up and playing fast and maybe Moose could win the Preakness, but, I certainly wouldn't claim to win the Kentucky Derby. Uh, it, it, you know, I get it. There's a 20-horse field, and there are odds that are very attractive, and I think we just try to get out clever a lot of times in the Derby, and sometimes it works out. And this year, I just wonder if, if, you know, you looked, and it was a, a regular race on a Thursday, and you looked at fierceness, whether you just wouldn't land that. Uh, it's going to be very intriguing, though, but – uh, you know, I walk around and in the supermarket the other day, people recognize me from TV and somebody said, hey, who do you like in the Derby? And we were talking and, and you know, what's a clever horse? And I said to him, and I'm looking at your top 10 and you have him third. And I said, you know what? The winner of the wood might be a little bit interesting. Yeah. Resilience. And I, I pulled up the replay here. We'll watch him win uh, from just the other day. Resilience is going to be the number one horse for uh, Bill Mott. Uh, getting it done in the uh, sixth career start, coming out of a poor performance in the uh, Risen Star. Uh, poor performance. No, it was a fourth place finish. Uh, let me let me revise that. Fourth place finish in the uh, the Risen Star, which has turned out to be just a phenomenal prep race right. uh, this year. But give us some thoughts on resilience because I, you have him third, and I think he's very interesting. I loved him last week. He was the key to that, uh, you know, that big three pick three for me. And, and he ran to expectations in there. He did the dirty work in that race in the Risen Star. There was lone speed that day in track Phantom, who had already won a couple stakes on the series there at Fairgrounds. So somebody had to go and put token pressure on him. That horse who does that, I say, who does the dirty work, hardly ever wins, right? That, that's just not the trip to be the only one to go after a quality front runner and try to keep them honest. You usually end up paying the price for it. He gave way a little bit in the stretch there. That was his first race in stakes company. He had come off a nice win down at uh, Gulfstream. I've liked this horse. I love his pedigree. Resilience has that brilliance on top, and he's got turf on the damn side. That is what I love in a triple crown horse. His second dam was Tranquility Lake. You might remember her. She was a superb race mare uh, on the West Coast and traveling around the country. Uh, she could go long, she could go on the dirt, she could go on the turf. And she's produced uh, a couple foals. So the mare that Resilience is out of is a half the Courageous Cat and uh, 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 Market. What was it? Aftermarket. Two horses that were multiple, like millionaire earth milers, you know. Uh, so it's a blue hen female family. I love this pedigree. And it's Bill Mott, who's, you know, just had such a renaissance with the younger horses in recent years that like he's a factor in these races now. Um, and, you know, he used to just be kind of the older horse turf guy, right? And and so he's cycled around to where he's playing on these big stages. I think resilience is really interesting. If I get cute and all in the derby and go against Fierceness for Sierra Leone, I can guarantee you it would be with resilience. So he's the horse I like next best. And he's going to be a nice price. So it's just a matter of how tempting do you get, you know, um, and let's watch them work, right? If Sierra Leone or Fierceness yeah. don't train all that great, uh, if, if Resilience is true. I hope Resilience doesn't train super good, and I'm afraid that he's going to because Mott forces just physically always look so good in the flesh that he's going to get a lot of attention, and I'm afraid that he's going to end up getting over that because he works really well. So I'm kind of hoping he just goes out there and works <laughs> in like 50 and uh, and just looks okay and, like, nobody pays attention. Or he works on a day when somebody else just, like, blisters the wind and, and, and takes all the oxygen out of the press, you know? <laughs> that would be good. If, if he has the second-best work on a particular day, but the other one is so dazzling that that's all anybody talks about, then we might be okay. But I, I get the weird feeling he's going to work really well and everybody's going to be talking about it. I, I agree that he's very interesting coming out of that wood. And finally, I just wanted some thoughts. You alluded to it a moment ago when you brought up Forever Young, pulled up the replay of the UAE Derby, undefeated Japanese runner, uh, 
ran in the beginning of the career undefeated, obviously, in Japan, and then goes over to Saudi Arabia, wins there, and then the other day won the UAE Derby. Uh, what, what do you make of the Jap? I, I think, like you say, I'm interested to see. I think the horse is going to take some action, certainly being undefeated, and the Japanese runners have been – so good internationally over the past, what, two, three years. Uh, I'm intrigued. Yeah. What do you make of Forever Young? If he had won that race by open length, you know, wins by four or five, drawing off, he's clearly the third choice in the betting, and he's going to be mid-single digits. He's six to one if he wins that last race handily, right? And he's the third choice in the Derby, uh, and then there's a gap between everybody else. The fact that he was kind of working like now the horse he did beat was the Southern Hemisphere four-year-old, right? Because they can run in that race in the UAE. So they allowed the Southern Hemisphere horses. So he did beat an older horse in that spot. And there was a good gap back to the rest. So maybe if that four-year-old doesn't run as well and he spits the pit and all of a sudden he wins off a little more convincingly, the, the effort of the runner-up in the UAE Derby might actually help you get five points on the tote towards in the <laughs> Kentucky Derby, right? Because if he would have backed out of it and this horse won by six or seven, he's five, six to one in the Derby. Instead, you're probably looking at 10 or 12. So uh, I, I think he's a factor. Yoshida Yahagi's the trainer, right? I mean, this is what they say, the, the Japanese Bob Baffert. He wins all the big races over there. He's come here and won Breeders' Cup races at Del Mar, you know, so he knows the path to get here. Forever Young's already here in the U.S. Um, uh, we'll get plenty of time to get acclimated to Churchill once clear in quarantine. Um, he's very interesting, right? I mean, there's a lot to like there. Um, what I thought was kind of neat, though, is they mentioned that what he was wearing equipment-wise in the UAE Derby wasn't blinkers. There was no cup on it. It was literally a face shield because the horse does not like – it's just fabric over his face with no blinker because he doesn't like to take dirt in the face. That's not a good sign for the yeah, Kentucky Derby yeah. if he doesn't break, right? I mean, you're not going to get any hotter or dirtier than in a race than you are in that 20 horse field. So if he doesn't like dirt in his face, that tells me they want a, a wide post draw. They want to keep this horse out in the clear. And if you notice, they were about five wide on the first turn of, of that race in the UAE Derby. And, and they just gave ground the whole way thinking they were on the best horse, but they were also keeping the dirt out of his face. So that's interesting. Like if, if he draws somewhere in the first, six, seven, eight post positions, it could be a tough trip. That's the kind of horse for the post draw. If you like this horse forever young, you want him as far wide as you can get probably. Yeah, the, he, he's going to be very interesting for, for certain. So it's it, it's shaping up uh, nicely. And as I say, maybe things will juggle up a little bit today with the, uh, the Lexington. We'll find out. But one way or the other, we'll check in again. Certainly probably Derby week, we'll, we'll get some Derby thoughts from you uh, as well. But we appreciate the, the conversation today on Keeneland as you focus on that during their meet. Folks can find your picks uh, on the website. And again, you can check out the, the video every night going over the card as well. Uh, Jeremy's Twitter feed or over on the Keeneland uh, YouTube channel. Jeremy, appreciate the thoughts on a little Keeneland action, old three-year-old uh, thoughts heading into the Derby as well. And as I say, we'll check in uh, again over the next uh, couple of weeks. Happy to do so. Have a great day, everybody. Good luck. Appreciate it. Jeremy Plan, courseplayernow.com, countdown to the crown and more. And again, he and Jeff Siegel, it's a fun uh, podcast. You can check that out a couple times a week on YouTube as well. All right, we'll take a break. When we come back, Matt Dinnerman will join us. We'll get some thoughts on Oaklawn today and more. Stay tuned. Haven't signed up for a Capital OTB account yet? Now's the time to take advantage of the sign-up bonus. Open up a new account with $200 or more, bet $400 by the end of the month, and receive a bonus $200 into your account. Plus, you can take advantage of everything an OTB account has to offer. Wagering from any device, live streaming, racing info, past performances, online promotions, and more. Sign up today and take advantage of the new account bonus. Details at CapitalOTB.com. Come on. I want sales reports on my desk by Monday. Whoops. My bad. Love racing? RTN brings you every live simulcast on your home television, plus live video streaming and race replays on your PC and mobile devices. To order, visit RTN.TV. RTN, a breed apart. Birdstone is an outside threat. They're coming down to the finish. Can Smarty Jones hold on? Two arch rivals have the head with Joe Hart bearing down on them. It's going to be a three-heart photo for the champion.
to the top. Here's the wire. Welcome back to Racing Across America. As promised before the break, joined now by our friend Matt Dinnerman from uh, Oaklawn. Uh, a couple of nice stakes at Oaklawn today, the Apple Blossom and the Count Fleet. Maybe we'll get some of Matt's thoughts on uh, the Arkansas Derby and the fantasy from a couple of weeks ago as well. Matt, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Very good. And, and uh, you know, I told you uh, while we were talking during the break, you're doing a great job down there at Oaklawn. And I I can't have you on the show and have you on for a few minutes without giving you big congratulations, the news that came out a, a couple of weeks ago. And I, you have to be thrilled. It gives you a nice year-round circuit and a year-round circuit in a couple of my favorite tracks to uh, watch and wager on as well. Congratulations on picking up the summer job at Monmouth. I'm very excited. Yeah, it should be a, be a great time. I mean, Mom, it's a beautiful spot. I'm very lucky. You got a phone call, pleasant surprise, asking, hey, you know, you want to be our next guy? We need an announcer. So i um, very excited. You know, a lot's been going on for me this year and a lot of different things in this business in particular. So very lucky to have landed on my feet with both two wonderful tracks. Yeah, and, and again, uh, congratulations there. We're, we're happy for you, and uh, it should be a fun summer. And, and I will tell you, uh, there, there are days off uh, at Monmouth when there's Saratoga racing. So if you happen to come up the turnpike, we broadcast live uh, every morning from the back stretch at Saratoga. So shoot me a, a text if you're in Saratoga someday, and we'll have you come in and sit, sit in with us some morning on the back stretch. That would be great. I think there's a one to five chance I'll be there on some weekday. So <laughs> sign me up. I like that. Very good. Uh, all right. Let's uh, take a look at uh, a couple of nice stakes today at Oaklawn. And as I say, uh, I'm watching you guys uh, during the day, and I have my monitor on the wall even here in the morning on the quad screen, and one of the tracks uh, on the screen is Oaklawn. And I saw Nancy doing her Saturday morning show, and it looked like a gorgeous day at Oaklawn today. Yeah, beautiful day at Oakland. I actually I just stepped outside here. It's probably 65 degrees right now. Uh, not a cloud in the sky, just sun and blue skies. So um, it's going to be a beautiful day, fast track, and we're expecting at least 30,000 people, probably upwards <laughs> from that on Apple Watch Day. It's a big day for us here. Uh, that's great. Uh, and uh, Saturdays, uh, you're, you're going to be plugged into the pregame show today, right? can listen in we start at 10 40 a.m uh central time uh, nancy holt this crystal connie and myself will be on there giving analysis for all 12 races it's a great show nancy and crystal do a great job and uh you know happy to help out when i can yeah we have nancy on uh, fairly often during the meet we had her a couple of weeks ago with the arkansas derby uh thoughts and that that uh, she was touting then her morning show, and I will again tout it. As I say, I was watching uh, on the monitor, and folks can find that online. She does a great job at the Saturday morning show as well, the interview show. All right, let's take a look at the Apple Blossom today, scheduled for uh, race 11, 546 your time, 646 our time here in upstate New York. Uh, mile and a 16th for the Phillies and Mares grade one event, $1.25 million. I pulled up a replay going back to the Pippin a little earlier at this Oaklawn meet back in January. Uh, the number two here is Misty Vale. I'm going to take a pop this afternoon with Misty Vale. Comes out of a close-up second last time in the Azari. It seems like she just runs well all the time, particularly at Oaklawn, and always gets overlooked and offers some value. She's 12-1 to 1 today. Clearly the horse to beat is the Baffert runner coming in from Southern California, Dare Manor. Wet paint getting the uh, four-year-old debut for uh, Brad Cox is interesting. What are your thoughts on the apple blossom? Well, I think Adair Manor is the speed of the speed. I don't think Flying Connection is one that really is fast enough to go with Adair Manor. I thought they were pretty passive last time to take her back as far as they did off a slow pace. I'm, I'm not exactly 100% sure what that was about uh, watching that replay because Bob Baffert trains his horses for speed. Yeah. So it was a little bit of an interesting trip, but uh, she just earned a career best buyer anyway. I think this time around, they're going to be a lot more aggressive. They're going to send her out of there. And I don't think there's anybody fast enough to go with her. Uh, and from there, it's going to be a matter of if she has the class to hold on. But it sure looks like she probably does. Uh, so she, I think, will be tough. But I don't think she's necessarily a lock. I think if she clears off on the lead, she'll be tough. But if for some reason, Flying Connection could press her and maybe a Dare Manor folds under that pressure a little bit. 
I actually think Shotgun Hottie is a very interesting price horse. I liked her last time. Uh, she ran better than she did first off the layoff. And if you look at her form cycle, she's a mare that seems to do at her best after a couple races off layoff. She always runs good third, fourth start off the layoff. She runs her best race. And remember, last year she beat search results in the grade three Molly Pitcher at Monmouth. So she has some class. She just hasn't shown it this year in her first two starts off the layoff. I'm hoping this time third start off the break with Paco Lopez. He's flying in the ride. He's two for two on her. So you got a jockey that knows her well. I think she's very interesting at a price. Uh, okay, now I'm going to have to box that one up with mine. A couple of 12 to ones. I'll box that one up with Misty Vale and, and uh, hope to knock it out of the park there and see if we can both beat a dare man. But a dare man, I think I agree with you. I think that's the, the horse to beat. Count Fleet uh, earlier on the card, really one of, to me, has become one of the fun sprint stakes uh, all season long, all year long. And, and you guys run it down at Oaklawn uh, with some very nice results that play out on the sprint side as the year goes along. I'm going to take a little pop in here with Tejano Twist. And I pulled up a replay of the Whitmore back on March 16th. Jackson Traveler from our friends at West Point Thoroughbreds won that day, the number six horse. Tejano Twist, the number two, runs second in a close-up nose finish. I'm going to look for Tejano Twist to get the edge this afternoon. Skelly in second. I, I Skelly's probably the horse to beat, but off the trip back from uh, Saudi Arabia, I, I went against slightly, and Jackson Traveler in my mix as well. Rivet, I think, is interesting for Steve Asmussen. What, what are your thoughts in the uh, the comp fleet? Well, I think you, you summed it up pretty good. I think Skelly's the horse I would twist fairly easily. Uh, I guess the question is that often is a horse that runs in the middle of the East, runs in a big race, and by you know mid-April, they're back at the races. So it's a big question mark. You know how this goes. Sometimes horses, they come back from there and they need a race or they bounce quite a bit. So... That's the question mark with Steve Asmussen. He, one thing that I've just learned about him being here is he's really a phenomenal horse. Because he knows yeah. exactly what types of horses all of them are. He knows when he can run horses back quick. He knows when he has to give them time. He knows how to train them if he runs back quick or off something like this. So um, I, I feel that he must feel that this horse is doing okay or he wouldn't run him in this race if he thought he was a tired horse. Um, Tejano Twist, he's got a great, great kick off the pace type of horse. I said when he run, won his first race here this year at the meeting, he actually won in December. I, I thought he had, you know, grade two, grade one talent, but went ready, ran that day. And he hasn't quite been able to run back to it last couple of starts, but he's run very well. Nonetheless, he just hasn't gotten a pace set up. A little bit concerned about the pace setup. I think Skelly's clearly the quickest horse. I'm just not so sure anybody's fast enough to go with this horse. Yeah. He can go sub 21. Um, so I'm interesting, but I don't know if he's good enough to run down Skelly on his best day. I know that Rivet's a horse that he's not really a front running type, but he's just sort of found himself there from what I've been told from people that know him best because the paces have not been quick in those races, and he's sort of just naturally feeling that speed, but you're not going to see that today. He's going to be trying to come from off the pace like you saw in the Mahoney Valley uh, sprint there. But I, I picked Skelly. I think that if he runs his race or something close to it, he'll be tough. But that's a question mark coming in from Saudi Arabia. Yeah, and that's the reason. I, and I went slightly against. I have him right underneath. He's the one to beat. And as you say, you, you kind of trust Asmussen to, to be picking the, the proper spot to come back. So he's the one to beat, certainly. I'm going to go with a slight uh, – uh, upset though with Tejano Twist. We will see how that works out for me. And you know, you mentioned Steve Asmussen, and, and uh, I'm going to be watching the fourth race today at Oaklawn with a lot of attention. Steve, speaking of Steve Asmussen, he has two in the fourth race today, and his kids are riding each one. I think that fourth race is going to be very interesting for the Asmussen family. Yeah, you've got a couple like that this weekend. <laughs> you've got a couple like that this weekend, and uh, I think. Steve, it's, it's like, you know, he trained so many horses and he's done this for so long. This is his life. But something that's new for him the last couple of years is being able to see his sons ride his horses. So I, I think that gives him even more reason to 
train horses the best he can and win. I'm sure it's a really cool thing for a whole family there. It's got to be. And uh, again, the fourth race, I know they, they face off. Uh, Matt, before we let you go, just wanted to go back a couple of weeks and get some thoughts. We'll, we'll show the stretch runs here of the Arkansas Derby. Uh, Muth over Just Steel. Mystic Dan, who I was really intrigued to see if he could come back off of that that big win earlier in the meet with the triple digit. He winds up third, but it wind up, wound up to be Muth in the Arkansas Derby. Your thoughts from the uh, the win a couple weeks ago? I thought Muth was as impressive as he could have been. I'm um, obviously a horse that doesn't need the lead at this point. Um, I, what, one thing that's unfortunate for him that he can't run in the Derby is there's not an abundance of speed in yeah. the three-year-old division this year, and I think he would have had a big advantage in that respect. Uh, and I hope, you know, how far does he want to go? And he showed that he's got plenty in the tank there to be a classic distance type of horse. So I was very impressed. I thought he did it the right way. And I really thought in the end of the race, there was more in the tank there. So, um, you know, Mystic Dan, by the way, he did he did not get a great trip on the first turn. Liberal Arts steady and got real rank under Tyler Daffleone. And Mystic Dan sort of got caught right behind him. I think he would have been a little bit closer. He wouldn't have beat Moose. I don't even know if he would have run second, but he would have been a little bit closer. But, um, nice horse. I still think that down the road you're going to see some decent things from him, but Moose certainly uh, towards the top of his division, if not at the top at this point, when you exclude the fact that Nysos, we're not going to see him for a little while. And Jess Steele taking the coach back to the Derby, uh, running second in there. And I also wanted to touch on the uh, the fantasy because, again, I had talked to Nancy uh, in preview of those races that morning, and I said to her, and it played out, the week before I had Kenny McPeak on, and he had runners at the fairgrounds on their big day and, and Turfway. So I talked about all those runners. We finished the interview, and I was talking to him off the air, and he said, man, you didn't bring up my horse in the fantasy. I really like her. And I'm like, oh, well, so I tucked that in my back pocket. And Torpedo Anna not only won, won convincingly, I think Torpedo Anna now goes into the Kentucky Derby uh, looking like – Kentucky Oaks, excuse me, Kentucky Oaks looking like a real contender off that win in the fantasy. Absolutely. That was as impressive yeah. as it could be, really. And um, she had, she has talent. I mean, she's always shown talent the way she won her main. And then she came back real quick, regressed, and took some time. So I, I, I feel like you can sort of cross that two back race out, given that she came back so quickly off the big maiden win and just was a total bounce candidate. And that's exactly what happened. You know, you need to think to justify her running in the Oaks, not only to win the fantasy against what I thought was probably a B to B plus type of field. I, I don't think you saw any Tarifas in there. I don't think you saw any Candies or any of those types of horses that we saw in the Ashland, Intel, any of those. Uh, but Torpedo Anna won like a Philly that it's time for her to run against the best of her crop. And um, she's sort of like Moose, but even more so just totally push button. Um, you know, put, puts herself in a perfect spot. She relaxed beautifully off the way off. Sometimes horses get fresh, and uh, she was totally relaxed and going nice and easy. Once they pushed the bump, it was like driving a Porsche. The engine came on and out of that. So um, before the Arkansas Derby Day, I was thinking, you know, we, we might see a Derby winner out of Arkansas more so than a Kentucky Oak type of Philly. And then after the day, I said, probably the other way around. I think <laughs> out of Arkansas than, than uh, the Derby. And I have now learned that uh, when I do an interview with Kenny McPeak at the end of the interview, I have to say, so who else should we talk about? <laughs> now, uh, now I've gotten that. Uh, I'll talk that in the back pocket as well. Uh, Matt, uh, always appreciate the conversation. Uh, have a great day down there. And again, I'm sure you will. I'm, I'm envious. I got to get back down to Oakland. It, it's so familiar to those of us up at Saratoga. I think the town is very similar and to look at the apron and on the big days um, and, and a nice big stakes day like this. Wish you guys a lot of good luck and a lot of fun down there. We will talk again. And as I say, congratulations also on the Monmouth gig. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everybody. You too. Matt Dinnerman from Oak Lawn Park. Again, nice day with uh, the Apple Blossom and the Count Fleet today. Nice steak stay at Keeneland as well. And we talked about that with Jeremy Plonk. So thanks to Jeremy for uh, stopping by. And I will be back in a little bit later with uh, OTB Live for a Saturday afternoon. 
I'll take a look at those two tracks and Aqueduct as well. I handicapped all three for the one sheet. If you want to pick up the selections on the website, capitalotv.com, um, and then look for the handicapping link and then click on handicap or support. Nice printable sheet. Uh, I didn't mention yesterday our cross country pick five play eh, for the team. Didn't get it done. We got through the first two legs and then uh, action moved on to Oaklawn. And I ran second in the next two legs. And then I had a $40 winner in the uh, last leg. So it, it had the potential to be a fun afternoon. But uh, we again a couple of second place finishes that uh, just we uh, we were right there, but uh, didn't manage to get it done. We will we will attempt on the next bankroll to make the magic happen. But you can make the magic happen today. Let me get my promo sheet here. I know what the promos are, though. Uh, pick and putt today here at the Clubhouse Racebook. Come on down, watch the Masters. We will randomly select people throughout the afternoon to step up to our little putting green. If you sink a putt, you can win some prizes. That's today and tomorrow here at the Clubhouse Racebook. And also today, the match bet promotion. Pop losing tickets uh, into our bin. We'll select throughout the afternoon. And you can match the amount on your losing ticket in a uh, free bet courtesy of OTB. That happens again today here at the clubhouse race, but then I should say there's also a, a limit. I think you can you match, we match up to twenty dollars maybe on those. Um, so again, come on down to the clubhouse race book today and have a little extra fun. Seven Eleven Central Avenue in Albany. All right, I'm going to wrap it up for this Saturday morning racing across America. Seth Merrow in the studio. Thanks for joining us as always. Really appreciate it. Should be a fun afternoon. Uh, hopefully we're, we're all cashing some tickets to make it extra fun. And again, we'd love to have you come down and join us at the Clubhouse Racebook for some fun as well. Uh, but we're, I'm just looking up, uh, looks like, it, as I say, I was watching Nancy on the, the monitor up here doing her she was, I, I think they do it in the winter circle, but it looked like a great day. Matt kind of confirmed that. And I'm seeing the, the live shot from the paddock at uh, Keeneland. And it looks like much improved at Keeneland as well. It looks sunny. I, hard to tell the temperature, although somebody just walked by in a golf shirt. So hopefully things are looking up and are more spring-like at uh, Keeneland than they have been the last couple of days where it looked like it was wet and cool. We'll also plug some aqueduct into the mix and some golf stream. It should be a fun Saturday afternoon. So wrapping it up, racing across America on this Saturday morning. Again, Seth Merrill in the studio. Thanks for tuning in. Back within the next uh, couple hours or so, about an hour and a half probably, we'll kick things off. OTB Live for a Saturday afternoon. See you then. You're watching OTB TV, a service of Capital Off-Track Betting.